Hello, I'm Neil Ferguson. I'm the Milbank Family Senior Fellow here at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. And one of my roles here is to chair the Hoover History Working Group. Uh, we have regular seminars, virtual uh, as well as real, and our most recent uh, featured Roger Lowenstein. Roger's uh, written some extraordinary books uh, in his career, Buffett, my own favorite, When Genius Failed, The End of Wall Street. Uh, he's also written Origins of the Crash, While America Aged, America's Bank. Uh, so he's somebody with a tremendous record of writing about American finance, but writing about it in a way that's accessible to the general reader. Uh, and that's what you'd expect from somebody who had such a distinguished career on the Wall Street Journal as a journalist. Though, as a young uh, man, as a student at Cornell, he was uh, planning or at least considering a career, career as an historian. His most recent book is his most historical. It's entitled Ways and Means, Lincoln and His Cabinet and the Financing of the Civil War, and it's published by Penguin Press. Roger, it's timely to be talking about war finance uh, with war raging in Eastern Europe. Let's talk a bit about the nature of war finance as a problem. Whether it's a civil war or a war between states, the same kind of problems always present themselves. Talk about those fundamental problems of war finance, and then let's apply them to the American Civil War. Well, we see uh, one cropping up in today's papers. Uh, there's so much uh, anxiety about the Europeans continuing to buy uh, gas and oil from Russia. Uh, in the Civil War, believe it or not, uh, the Union was desperate for cotton, and they continued to trade uh, with the South. And, and uh, Lincoln and his uh, cabinet people uh, put forth the explanation that this would be better for the North and for the South. Uh, his generals, Grant and Sherman, were apoplectic that the North was uh, supposedly going to be finding loyal Southerners with whom to trade, as if uh, the Europeans uh, now could buy their uh, gas from uh, anti-Putin uh, oligarchs, as if that were possible. But, but so the economies... You know, it's it's in the nature of economies to want to trade with each other. That's always true, and war in, interposes this sort of uh, this sort of blockade on normal economies and in great conflict with that. And and the lines aren't always drawn so smoothly. And of course, the other uh, truism of wars uh, is that they cause inflation because basically uh, every war creates this this vast demand that wasn't there. You had an economy producing. Uh, beans and and handkerchiefs and books and things like that and suddenly now you want to produce shells and and uh, all sorts of things you didn't need before and however you square it uh, you're going to have uh, greater demand and you're going to have inflation cropping up somewhere as we as we do now and as we did in, in the 1860s in the United States. Now one of the things I learned from your book is that when Lincoln uh, became president uh, the United States government really didn't have tremendous capacity for war making, particularly when it came to raising the resources to pay for a war. Talk a bit about the financial revolution, the fiscal revolution, maybe I should say, that the Civil War brought about. So the US is fully an industrial power in 1860. We had the railroads, we had the iron, we had the big factories, uh, but in a financial sense, uh, we were what the uh, British might have called the developing country, and 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 not very developed. Uh, every uh, there was no national bank, uh, there was no national currency. Banks were chartered by the individual states. They each issued notes, basically IOUs. These were discounted at varying rates. Nobody knew if you were in New York well, what a note from a Michigan bank was worth, say. So it'd be discounted, uh, and there was just there was no basis on which to finance such a vast undertaking as the war, which was to consume more money than had been spent in all of the years of the Republic prior to then. So um, we, were, we were truly a developing country or an undeveloped country. What was it that Lincoln did that changed that? If you had to kind of single out a few key changes that, that helped the North 
win the war, not not military changes, but yeah. but financial and economic changes. Well, a couple of things. Uh, he uh, created a, a national currency, first the greenback, a paper currency, and then backed that up with uh, national banknotes. He created a new banking system so that there would be banknotes, uh, universal banknotes, the same in every state, which became the basis of finance, not just during the war, but uh, in the Industrial Revolution, the Gilded Age, and so on that, that followed. The other tremendous thing was he created a tax system. I didn't mention before that there was no tax system in the United States other than the, the tariff system. Right. Obviously, in a war, trade, uh, there's not as much trade. That's not reliable. Lincoln created um, the uh, Internal Revenue Service, the, four, the agency that became the Internal Revenue Service, and, and a system for taxing the productive power of the Union states, which gave the Union a vast advantage over the Confederacy, which did no such thing. And finally, uh, by enlisting a, uh, uh, a very far-sighted financier named Jay Cook, they really created the basis of investment banking. They sold bonds in every hill and dale across the country, uh, a predecessor of the great bond issues in the private sector of the steel companies and the railroads of the 1870s and 80s and 90s. Now, how much of the credit for all this should go to Lincoln himself and how much to a less well-known figure, Simon Chase? Tell us a bit about his role as Treasury Secretary and, and how much of, of this really was down to him. Well, Lincoln definitely supported the big picture. This is all stuff he had wanted for his uh, years in the wilderness, his early career. But once the war happened and Chase was the Secretary of the Treasury, Lincoln obviously was worrying about uh, the war itself, the military issues, and about emancipation and those issues, it was really left to Sam and Chase and to the, some very key figures in the Congress. Chase was actually, uh, had a philosophy counter to all these, these developments. He was a Jacksonian, he had been a Democrat. Very grudgingly though, uh, he'd wanted to, to, to uh, fund the war in gold. It turned out there wasn't enough gold, gold being the traditional uh, currency and, and medium of traditional financiers, grudgingly, uh, Chase came around to the, to the realization uh, you had to have a paper currency, it had to have backing, thus the National Banking Act, you had to have some very liquid currency, thus the greenbacks, and you had to have a tax system that really tied American productive power to the government so that the government paper uh, wasn't just flimsy paper, it was resting on something. And Chase, and along with Thaddeus Stevens, the chairman of the Wayne's Means Committee, William Fessenden, uh, Senate Finance Chairman and ultimately Treasury Secretary also replacing Chase, these pu people pushed the United States, which had always had a, a tremendous antipathy to taxation. Supposedly that was a, a reason we rebelled against England, these taxes on tea and everything. And you see it today, we still have an antipathy to, to taxation. But these people realized in wartime, you're either going to have taxation or you're going to have frightful inflation, as we'd had in the Revolutionary War. So I think there's a you know, uh, the credit goes divided in, in some more or less equal parts to Chase and Thaddeus Stevens and to Lincoln. One thing that, that seems pretty clear from your book is that this is one of those transformations in government, in the, the nature of the state, that war has often brought about in all kinds of different locations. Uh, it seems to me that this was more than just a series of expedients uh, to finance a war, there was almost a developmental dimension to this. And when you turn to some of the legislation that went through the 37th Congress, uh, it looks like they were looking far beyond the war uh, in terms of what they foresaw for the, for the US economy after the war. Talk a bit about some of those broader, uh, more strategic measures that weren't really about just winning the war. Very much so. The Republicans who were, of course, in power, uh, most of them had been former Whigs. They had been the party of uh, opportunity, prosperity, meaning they wanted the government to take an active place in this. That had not been the American system of government. We were the government that governs least idea. We'd had numerous bills for homestead acts, railroads, canals, all vetoed. Six straight presidents vetoed these bills. Under the Civil War, uh, there was a new philosophy at hand. It was the philosophy of nationalism, not, not nationalism in the aggressive sense of the word is used today, in the sense of doing things at a national level. So when they passed the National Banking Act, uh, uh, John Sherman, a leading senator, said, 
we want things to be as national as possible. That had suddenly, the, the, the thinking had switched. This became a good, a good thing to do things at the national level. When they proposed the taxation system, there was opposition from a congressman who said, well, shouldn't we have the states collect the tax? They've always been in charge. Thaddeus Stevens said, no, no. This was the problem of the Articles of Confederation, the, the original American system of government, which was too weak to survive. That's why we drew up a, co a constitution because there was no federal financial power. We want this to be at a federal level. So this was really turning Jefferson on its head. The, the epigram to the book from Robert Penn Warren is the revolution did not create a nation. In, in all these senses, both in the sense of uh, new functions that the federal government took on uh, and a new thinking about what the role the federal government was, uh, Lincoln and his Congress and cabinet made the federal government uh, a nation for the first time. I couldn't help thinking as I was reading the book, only of all the founding fathers, Alexander Hamilton would really have been comfortable with uh, this transformation of, uh, of a federal system into a, a nation. L let me conclude our conversation by asking you some of those awkward what if questions that <laughs> have always interested me. That, that clearly is an imaginable scenario in which uh, Humpty Dumpty is never put back together again. And uh, the outcome of, of the Civil War is, in fact, uh, that the Confederacy survives, rather in the same way that in the, the wars that produced the German Reich, we call them wars of unification. Actually, they weren't, strictly speaking, because Austria, a large chunk of German-speaking Europe, was left out of, uh, of what emerged in 1870-71. Was there a scenario, a plausible scenario, of, of Confederate survival and, and the nation that Lincoln built being just the, the Union, just the North? Absolutely. Uh, as late as 18, the summer of 1864, that's after three years and some odd months of war, Grant's army is stuck in the mud in Petersburg, Virginia. He's suffering horrendous losses. Horace Greeley, the most famous journalist and a, a radical Republican, is writing columns saying, our country bleeds for peace. It fears conscriptions of, of new legions of men. We can't bear it anymore. Lincoln's advisors are telling him, you cannot win the elections over, which means sue for peace. Uh, this is, this is, we're very close to the, the, the Union's tolerance for fighting the war ending and for, and for Lincoln losing the election, which would have made it a fait accompli had McClellan been elected. Uh, uh, fortunately, if you're, if you're sitting up in Boston, Massachusetts and happy that the, the Union was preserved on a basis of emancipation, uh, uh, Sherman conquers uh, Atlanta uh, in September, the dam breaks. And um, Lincoln, of course, sweeps in the election and, and Grant uh, moves on in Virginia. But, but as much as you can ever play what if, there was a what if, and it was quite far advanced into the war. And last question, what if Britain had decided to give the Confederacy its backing and uh, had provided more financial support? Is that a realistic counterfactual? That is a realistic counterfactual that certainly would have helped the South. I think what they needed more, uh, the financing would have been wonderful for them. Recognition uh, would have been wonderful for them. But I don't think the Union was going to give up because Britain stepped in. I think what, um, what the South really needed was for uh, the British to have sent uh, troops, ships, and so on. Was that realistic? Uh, I, I don't think so. As much as people in the United States uh, debated what uh, Britain, who Britain's sympathies were for, were with, what Palmerston was concerned with were not Britain's sympathies, but their interests. I don't think it was in Britain's interest to be involved in a war across the ocean with a, a now industrialized United States. So I think, I think he was always going to uh, uh, talk an interested game, but 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 unlikely to commit forces. And public opinion, especially liberal opinion, was decidedly against the South. The more slavery became the issue that the war appeared Absolutely. to be about. Well, Roger, I congratulate you on a tremendous contribution to our understanding uh, of the Civil War. And uh, in some ways, its most daunting aspect, the complexities of, of war finance. Uh, you've done a, a wonderful job of explaining those 
uh, in, in, in terms that a lay reader can easily understand. The book, once again, is Ways and Means, Lincoln and His Cabinet and the Financing of the Civil War. But I sense that it's about more than just that. It's really about uh, the making of the United States as a, a modern nation state uh, with the fiscal capacity to wage not only war at home, but as uh, subsequent events would prove war abroad as well. Uh, thank you so much, Roger, for spending time with us. Uh, the talk was great. Uh, this interview has been terrific, too. I wish you every success with the book and, of course, look forward to reading your next one. Neil, terrific talking with you. Thank you.